Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website is educateforlife.org, and you can pick up all kinds of resources on that website. I've been teaching 12th grade apologetics for 12 years now, and I've got a tons of information up there that you can use that can help you build a firm foundation for both yourself and those you're seeking to disciple or mentor, whether that's your kids, whether it's a small group, no matter what it might be. Um, there's all kinds of resources there that will help you get the job done and build a firm foundation in your faith. Uh, we are airing here in uh, Southern California down in San Diego on KPraise 12, 10 a.m., as well as FM 106.1 in North County. And my guest is also a uh, uh, local uh, Southern Californian, although he's up in Loma Linda. Chris, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to, to uh, talk to you. One of the, the subjects that you are an expert in is something that I've really been interested in for a long time. And um, your, your co-author, I have deep respect for uh, Dr. John Sanford. Um, I, one of his books uh, on genetic entropy is one of my all-time favorite apologetic books. I just think it's uh, amazing. But uh, Chris, real, you know, we're talking about, for those of you listening, what we're talking about today, what Chris is an expert in, and what uh, he, he authored a book with Dr. John Sanford called um, Contested Bones. And this is really examining that very famous uh, icon in which you see the chimp-like ancestor and then the, the little monkey gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger all the way you get up to uh, people. And uh, I want to kind of start off with a bang, uh, Chris. Um, Chris. Christopher Roop, by the way, you guys, for the, those of you listening, you can check him out at backtogenesis.org. That's with a two, backtogenesis.org. And he's also got a new, a new documentary coming out very soon, dismantleevolution.com. Uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about your book in particular was that you don't cite, I mean, you do cite uh, potentially creation resources, but you're citing actual um, you know, the, the secular scientific literature in order to uh, question this claim that we evolved from a chimp-like ancestor all the way up through these icons into um, modern-day man. Uh, why did you, how were you able to do that, is what I want to know. Yeah, so that was one of the surprises when I went to research uh, this topic. Because if you go to natural history museums, or if you read books that are uh, by the, dis the famous discoverers like Donald Johansson who discovered Lucy or Lee Berger who discovered Homo naledi, for example, um, or just look at National Geographic, you'll find that they, they have a view of evolution that most people just take for granted and maybe just assume that most everyone else would agree with those paleoanthropologists. Those are, another term is human paleontologists. But if you actually dig into the scientific literature, the peer-reviewed journals, you'll see that it is every major claim is contested. And that's why we titled the book Contested Bones. So for those who say that Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis is our ancestor, others will say, no, um, actually we challenge that view. Some have even said it's a mixture of, of Australopithecus and homo bones. In other words, an ape human mixture. Um, same thing with almost all of the major so-called missing links or hominid species. So they're very contested. And the public has not heard the full story of these uh, hotly contested bones. Yeah, that's completely unknown. I mean, for the most part, um, the general public has, uh, for a lot of people, has this idea that, yeah, uh, you know, these are factual. It's very scientifically based. There's been lots of observation and tests. And yet, that's not the case at all. That's correct. And, and you'll see, you know, uh, the, the look on the internet and type in, you know, some of the famous findings like Artipithecus, and you'll see all these sensationalized popular press articles. Then if you just, you know, hold tight for just a year or so, or maybe not even, go into the scientific literature, you'll find other experts in the field challenge those, those um, widely promoted claims. And it's, so it's very interesting to see the full controversy, um, you know, just peel those layers back and dig a little deeper at what you'll find. So give us an example of uh, one of these um, that is, you know, been for a long time kind of placed up there by those who are promoting evolutionary ideas as a leading missing link. What would be a good example of some of the glaring um, uh, deficiencies in the argument that, that just don't line up? Yeah, I think one of the most famous ones to mention is the one I did a moment ago, and that's Lucy's time. 
So when, when I say the word Lucy, it's a nickname that refers to a single skeleton, or believed to be a single skeleton, that was found in Hadar, Ethiopia um, in 1974 by Donald Johansson. However, there's many more, hundreds of other bones that have been attributed to Lucy's kind or Lucy's species. And Lucy's species is named Australopithecus afarensis. It just means southern ape from afar. But if you look in museums today, natural history museums all over and textbooks, you'll see Lucy is represented as if it's an upright walking, um, you know, bipedal hominid ancestor is what they'll call it. But if you- Yeah, I've heard, yeah. I, I've heard Chris that um, some people have said that uh, Lucy walked upright because of its hip joint, because of maybe the way its neck was shaped, because of a uh, knee bone, um, that, that this gave the impression that this was something that was on its way to evolving into a modern day human. Yes. And I talked about this in Dismantle, uh, the upcoming documentary. There's actually a lot of, there's actually three competing views in the paleoanthropology community. Um, one of the views is, is the one of, that of Johansson embraces. He's the discoverer of Lucy. So he promotes Lucy as upright walking in a manner just like modern humans. And he's known as a terrestrialist. And so he'll emphasize the bones that look more human. And then you'll go and you'll find out that there's also arboreals. Those are the paleoanthropologists who will emphasize bones that look more ape-like. And they'll say, no, we don't think Lucy walked quite like humans. It was more like and they'll, they'll draw comparisons to living apes, for example, and say it looks more ape-like, certain features. Um, but then you have a less well-known view, and this is the third competing view. This is the view that says, actually, we think that uh, there's compelling evidence to show that it's the reason why we see ape bones and human bones is because it literally is an accidental co-mixture of Australopithecus and homo bones. And so these paleoanthropologists, including Richard Leakey and other famous experts would have doubted this, would say that it's actually not a valid tax, it's not a real species. Wow. This is in the scientific literature, and I document this extensively in contested bones, but the public is not aware of the full controversy. Yeah, now is there, um, is this discussion moving in any particular direction or for, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, I feel like people have stopped talking about it in general. I mean, you, you and Dr. Sanford wrote uh, one of the very few books on this subject that um, is so thorough, like you were saying, there, there hasn't been another book written on this subject in detail um, for how many years? Yeah, I think the last book was Marvin, Marvin Lubenow's. It was published in 2000 or 1992, I think. I believe that's the first edition that was published again later, updated in 2004. So that's, that's why Dr. Sanford and I really felt led to work on a book like this because it was, we needed an update. There was a lot of new findings, a lot of new claims have been made, we needed to address them. In the secular scientific community, are they still searching for um, missing links? Is this something that um, there's a lot of uh, research money going towards, is finding uh, missing links between a chimp-like ancestor and modern man? Absolutely. I, I describe it as a growing field. Um, wow. The growing field, especially with Lee Berger, his findings in more recent times, he's found Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi both them since I think about 2008, and then again in 2013, promoted in 2015 now. So in recent years, we, find, we found really an explosion of, of, of popular press and articles and social media discussions on this topic. So it is a growing field. So this is a book for anybody who's a, a layman apologist. This is a required reading here. If you're out there, you guys, and you're listening to this, uh, this is the most thorough book there is on this particular subject. It's the most cutting edge book. It's the most detailed book. I can't, um, I can't recommend it uh, highly enough. It's an issue in which Christians need to be well informed, especially those of you who have an interest or God has given you a gift in apologetics. Um, this is something that's got to be a required reading. It's got to be on your bookshelf. And it's a great resource that you can constantly reference when you're having discussions, whether that's with family members, m members whether it's on the internet, whether it's you know, uh, you're writing articles for your own website, uh, use this book because it's got tons of um, uh, sources. They're, they're, they're citing their sources all over the place. And like he's saying, a lot of them are secular. So uh, it's a very, very valuable. Um, so yeah, you know, when I, it's interesting because I've been teaching this and I always do a unit on this particular subject. I don't go nearly as in depth as you guys do in the book, but um, a while back, um, there was one that came up, Google actually put the, the lemur fossil on their Google page, Ida. claiming, uh, you, you, yeah, Ida, 
this is a missing link. And I actually had students coming to me during that time saying, oh my gosh, Mr. Conover, they found a missing link. And I was like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's give it a little time. Uh, yeah. What's the scoop on, on uh, Ida? Yeah, so Ida, you, you've already basically pinned it you know, perfectly. Ida looks like a lemur simply because it is. And I think even now, experts in the field would say, oh, well, we're not so sure anymore. So, you know, and that was about, I believe, according to conventional dating methods, it's about 50 million years old around there. Um, we focus largely on the ones that supposedly evolved since the chimp human split within the last six million years to the present. Those yeah. are the most famous. But yeah, Ida looks like a lemur in every respect simply because it was. <laughs> But yeah, oddly, you know, this is what evolution has to, evolution as a theory does have to explain the origin of humans from creatures that ultimately go back to something like a lemur. And before that, something that even goes back to something like a rodent, <laughs> like Perga. Yeah. So, yeah. That's interesting. So um, how many of these, as you, how many different uh, hominid uh, fossils did you analyze in the book? What, what were the total amount that you looked at as far as the claims of missing links? So we looked at, Actually, I think it was like eight hominids. So Homo neanderthalensis, that's everyone's probably heard of Neanderthals. Um, Homo yeah. erectus is another famous one. Homo floresiensis, that one might not be as well known to the average person, but the nickname is Hobbit. Um, Austral um, Australopithecus afarensis, Arty, which is the species name is Artipithecus ramidus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus sediba, Homo nati. Um, the general public doesn't, you know, what I find is really interesting is that if you talk to a typical college student, uh, they'll generally accept evolution. Um, yeah. They'll they'll kind of, oftentimes they'll say, well, I, I just don't believe Adam and Eve. I think, that's, I think that's silly. I think it's myth. And they'll, when I've done surveys, about 80 out of 100 will routinely say that they believe in the hominid species as our ancestors instead of Adam and Eve. But if you ask them some questions, you'll find out they don't really know very much at all about these hominid creatures. They just know some of the nicknames. So as Christians, we really have an opportunity to, to do, the, do the research, do the homework. And what you'll find is that you can really engage people and have an effective, fruitful conversation about this topic. Because again, it is a major stumbling block. So many people have been led to believe that we are evolved apes and we don't need, there's no evidence for Adam and Eve, which is also not true. Um, so it's an important topic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm stunned too um, on the amount of people who are completely uninformed about these subjects and yet have just kind of, um, you know, swallowed it whole, just said, okay, yeah, I guess it's true, you know? And that, I, you know, I, I talk to my students a lot about this and I say, look it, you know, we have the truth on our side, but if nobody gets to hear the truth, what's going to happen, right? People are just going to accept whatever they, whatever they hear. So uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to do is get that information out there. That's right. And the exciting thing about this book is, ironically, we ended up agreeing with a lot of the evolutionists who, who uh, have these competing views. You know, they'll say, well, actually, I think Artie is nothing more than an extinct ape. Yeah. <laughs> more than a co-mixture of ape bones and human bones. And we just say, well, that, that, was my, that was my understanding just from looking at the bones and the anatomy. Yeah. And then I read it in the scientific literature, and I'm just like surprised. I'm like, wow. So <laughs> there's yeah. something to it. They're, they're saying the exact same thing as the creationists, but, but people just... Uh, don't know it, right? Yes, I just disagree with the timeline. I don't agree. Uh, so we have a whole chapter on the dating methods, about forty pages on the different radioactive dating methods. So oh, we, that's really that's fantastic. Yeah. That's another huge one that always comes up is you know how old is the Earth and these sort of issues uh, yeah. that are so related to this particular issue also. But um, you know, so when when they're digging these up, give us um, give us some background on how this works. When somebody's digging up bones and everything. What does that look like and why do they draw the conclusion that, okay, I think this is a missing link? Why don't they draw the conclusion that, okay, this is some sort of uh, ancient uh, monkey or it's some sort of a, some sort of chimp or it's, or it's a person? Because you're, you're clearly saying, I mean, your, your biblical view is there are people and there, there are animals, but there is no progression from one to the other. Yes. So when you, when you look at them, how do you break that down? You go, okay clearly Neanderthal was a person and then clearly this one over here, whatever it was, Ramapithecus or whatever it is, is a monkey. How, how did you and, uh, and Dr. John Sanford uh, break that down? Yeah. So one thing that's really key to understanding this issue is to, is to try to put yourself in the mind of an evolutionary pattern of ecologist. They think, they think fundamentally different than a Christian. No, no surprise there. 
So obviously they don't accept Genesis as literal history. Um, they oftentimes just dismiss that outright and they'll say, well, we definitely evolved, like you said, through a series of transitional forms. So when they go into the field and they find a bone bed, you have to understand that if they, if they think in terms of, of the, the timeline of evolutionary time of about 6 million years to the present for the chimp human split. And so they're thinking, okay, according to their view, they believe that the origin of the first humans, the genus Homo, they believe that was around 2.5 million years old. Some say a little older, two point, between 2.8 and 2.5, it varies depending who you ask. So when you say, for our listeners, Chris, when you say uh, genus Homo, um, you're talking about modern human or what are you talking about exactly? That's, a, that's the question I'm trying to get at, exactly. Okay. So they'll say that the earliest members of the genus Homo are the earliest primitive humans that are starting to look more and more like us. That's just a, kind of a vague way of saying, I guess. But here's the key. Because they believe that there should not be... So from that position, they believe you should not find any anatomically modern-looking bones older than 2.5 million years old. Mm. Imagine, so if kind of though, imagine if they found stone tools, footprints fossilized in ash, for example, human-looking bones, partial human skeletons. Imagine if, if they have really a growing amount of evidence that shows we can find anatomically modern human-looking bones predating the origin of genus homo. If we could find that, that would effectively falsify the ape to man theory. Mm. It's, although, it's kind of like, here's an analogy. You can obviously coexist with your grandparents, but you can't be born before your grandparents. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, well, completely. You can't uh, have humans existing before they supposedly evolved, but yet we are finding, we document this in chapter 11, if the chapter's called coexistence, we find clear evidence of human bones, partial skeletons, footprints, human artifacts, predating the origin of the first humans. So you're essentially saying they're putting the cart before the, the horse rather than allowing the evidence to inform their, their uh, theory, they're allowing their theory to inform their evidence. Yes, and here's the key. So when they find these human looking bones, they understand anatomy. They're experts in anatomy. So they can acknowledge this, this looks human in this respect, and they have certain terms to describe it, primitive or derived. And putting that aside for now, keeping things straightforward, even though they'll acknowledge and they'll say yeah, this bone is anatomically indistinguishable from modern Homo sapiens, they'll even say virtually identical to Homo sapiens. They'll use that <laughs> kind of language. Even though they acknowledge the anatomy is clearly modern human, because of the theory, just like you're saying, they have to say, well, it just proves that Australopiths were bipedal, so they must have had very human-looking bones. They must have had very human-looking uh, features because that's, that's how evolution happened. It happened in a mosaic fashion where certain wow. parts evolved before others, certain skeletal parts. So that's amazing. Yeah. So as a Christian, we're trying to say, wait a second, let's just look at the anatomy. Let's just use the real observational science. Let that guide our, you know, instead of, instead of force-fitting the data. Yeah. And what you come to is include a conclusion that is very biblical. Apes and humans coexisted as far back as common fossils are found, and that's consistent with Genesis. So the Bible teaches that God created man and apes on the same day of the creation. Mm. So the fossil record remarkably fits that pattern. So um, what about, and you talk about this in the book too, I know you talk about the hobbit-type uh, creatures, and some people are saying, well, that's clearly not a monkey. It's clearly not a person. So what is this type of creature that is uh, in between? Are you saying it's an extinct human? We even hear um, certain Christians talking about that there were subhumans that pre-existed Adam and Eve. Um, so how do you respond to this issue when you have a creature that is clearly not, not human, it's clearly not uh, ape? Uh, what, what is that in the paradigm that, that Adam and Eve are the beginning of history? They are historical figures. Uh, how does this, this uh, type of creature fit in? Yeah, so excellent question because you're right. There's a lot of confusion even within the church. Um, I accept Genesis as literal history. I believe the Hebrew language is clear. It's historical narrative. Mm -hmm. So that's the genre of, of the early chapters in Genesis. And I do believe that um, you don't have any uh, you know, pre-human species. So there's no such thing as, um, there's only one human species, Homo sapiens. We're all Homo sapiens. But from the evolutionary point of view, they don't think like that. They believe that there was at one point many human species, dozens of, of human species. Homo sapiens is not just 
You know, that's, that's just one type. They also believe there's homoniantophalensis, homofluorescentis, like you mentioned, homoniantophalensis, homodenisovans, and so forth. So they believe in lots of different um, human species. They don't even believe in Adam Eve at all. Now, those who believe, who are Christians and believe in an old earth, they think that there could have been soulless, hominid creatures that lived before Adam Eve. I reject that. I think we, don't, we don't have any. We don't have any reason to be, believe that. I feel it's very ad hoc, or or uh, they're just tacking it on. There's to try to, I don't know what. I, and I, it's a little bit confusing to me because I, I think to myself, well, the evidence is overwhelming from the from the um, fossil record that the biblical narrative is historically true. And so I, I'm not. They're, they're trying to ram a square peg in a round hole. And yes. so, and, and so, yeah. Go go on about that. That's interesting. Yeah, so they're borrowing heavily from the evolutionary perspective, in my opinion, because they're basically yeah. embracing the same taxonomic classifications as they are, and I don't think they're as, they don't seem to be as privy to the controversies. So consider Homo, homo floresiensis or Hobbit that was found in the island of Flores. And this, this um, supposed species, if you look at the bones, it's very interesting because overall the anatomy is clearly human. However, the Homo floresiensis stood about, you know, roughly around Four, three and a half to four feet, I forgot exactly the height, and it had a very small cranial capacity, about 420 cc's. So it's an individual that was very small in stature, small cranial capacity, but nevertheless, the, the, the hip bones, um, the feet, the hands, all the diagnostic uh, parts of the skeleton that are well preserved are clearly human anatomically. Now, here's part of the controversy that you won't be, that you may not be aware of. If you look at the scientific literature, Homo floresiensis is hotly debated, just like the other one. So for Hobbit, there are experts who are on the discovery team who disagree that it was a new species. And some of these people who had dissenting views said, actually, I think it's just a homo sapien, just a small abiding human. And so is there any evidence for that? Well, even today, there is still a pygmy population living on the island, not too far from where they found homo floresiensis. And so I do think that is the best interpretation and that is also compatible with the biblical view. It's yeah. So how come we don't hear more, more from these uh, dissenting scientists? Why don't we hear from these people? Are they afraid to come out and talk about their dissent? Or is it just not published? Is it just not getting out there? What, what, how, how come it took so much digging for you and Dr. Sanford to be able to find this information? Yeah, in the case, good question. In the case of Hobbit, there is, it was in the popular press. They did do a good job in that case. I think they there was a back and forth that happened and they did do an excellent job of promoting that, but that's not the case generally. Typically, um, you don't know about the different views of Lucy, for example. You don't know about the different views of even the other thoughts. So yeah. it really just required a lot of research in the, in the peer reviewed scientific literature. We focused almost exclusively on evolutionary journals. We just really want, we really wanted to understand the claims that were made. Mm. And you took like four years to do that. At least, at least four years. Yeah, um, and and it was you know it was something I obsessed over at night, you know, all the time. <laughs> that's so it, great. It was all an all-consuming project, but it was yeah very exciting. Well, it's, it produced an incredible uh, result. So thank you for all your hard work. For those of you just tuning in, my guest is Christopher Roop, and uh, he is the author with Dr. John Sanford, uh, Cornell University professor um, of uh, con uh, contested bones. And if you want to check out more about him, back to Genesis.org, back to Genesis with the number two.org. DismantleEvolution.com is the upcoming documentary. And tell us about that, uh, Chris. What is Dismantle Evolution and what's the, uh, you know, what was the um, premise of this? Why did you decide to move forward in this direction? Thanks for asking. So I'm really excited about the documentary because um, I'm really trying to reach an audience that is, um, generally, the hostile skeptics, if you will, those who say they need, they just need the hard evidence. And so it really, really came at it, same way as Professor Bones, where I focused on the primary scientific literature and we're really trying to go out of our way, even though I don't think it's fair, we're trying to go out of our way not to use creation sources as much as possible. And we're just, we just lay the case for uh, the biblical perspective by using, so let me just break up like this. There's four different scenes in this manual. The first one is, is just basically on the nature of science. And the major conclusion we come to, you'll, you'll have to find out when you watch the supporting evidence, is that 
it's not really an issue of science versus faith. A lot of people think that's the creation evolution debate is all about. It's, it's science, and they think, when I think science, I think evolution versus religion or faith. In reality, even Ernst Meyer, a world famous evolutionary biologist, he passed away in 2005 from Harvard, he acknowledges that evolutionary biology is not like a hard science, like physics and chemistry. It's actually a historical narrative. It's a history. He, that's exactly the language he uses. Because so, you're not... You're not, you, can't, you can't pull these dead creatures back into a lab and, you know, watch that whole process. It, it's something that you have to look at it and you have to interpret it. It's stuff that's happened in the past. I mean, it's just like digging up, digging, digging up old, uh, you know, Roman weapons or Roman coins and then analyzing what happened uh, through uh, your, your digging efforts, right? That's right. So it's very different than, say, finding a cure for a disease, um, you know, repeatable experimentation. You can falsify it and you can... It's directly observable, testable, repeatable in the present. But we're dealing with things about origins. Those events happened in the past. We weren't there. So we don't have direct access to the past. We do have fossils, which exist in the present. We do have DNA patterns and so forth. So the question is, which view of history, the evolutionary view of history or the biblical view of history, best explains the evidence? In other words, is the evidence internally consistent within the evolutionary view of history or biblical view of history? That's called the internal critique. That's ways to evaluate the creation evolution controversy and what we show is that the major fields of science including biology paleoanthropology like we just discussed and modern genetics are remarkably consistent with the major events recorded in the biblical view of in genesis and so and anyway I'll, i won't go too far right now but <laughs> sure sure we don't want to give it away right but um that's that's fantastic and so how is this um is this is dismantle evolution, is there a big focus on hominid uh, fossils and, and the whole chimp to, to modern man? Or is this uh, tackling a new subject of um, study? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the scene one is just on laying the groundwork, leveling the playing field. So look, it's really a, uh, an issue of one view of history versus the other. And then we go into the evidence. And the first area we focus on is, is biology. So we look at the very popular um, icons of evolution, the, the, the popular examples in textbooks of so-called microevolution. I think it's a misnomer, but the small observable changes that you can see today, which does fall in the realm of good science. Now, evolutionists will try to extrapolate those small changes called microevolution, and they'll say, given enough time, the small changes will add up to big changes. The problem with this thinking is that there's a big difference between microevolution and macroevolution. The key difference is this. Microevolution does not involve any new genes, there's no new sets of genetic instructions being produced through these processes. However, to change, say, apes into man, large scale changes, macroevolution, you need lots of new functional DNA sequences, mm -hmm. new genes to code for innovative structures and functions. So, part scene two is all about can random mutations and natural selection, genetic drift, those are the evolutionary, those are the evolutionary mechanism of change, can that result in macroevolution given enough time? In other words, can you extrapolate the small changes into big changes? And that's very interesting because what we're finding is, I don't want to give it all away, but basically all of the observable changes that we're seeing in the present are not involving any novel sets of genetic instruction in new genes. Hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, and now, now when is this uh, documentary coming out? So the documentary comes out um, October 9th to 11th. We're, we're having a free week, one weekend premiere. And so if you go to dismantledevolution.com, you'll see a link right in the banner that says, you know, click this link and you'll be able to watch it anytime you're that weekend for free. After that, it'll be available on DVD or Blu-ray. And, and real quick, I just should say, there's also two more scenes. Scene, real quick, scene three is on paleoanthropology. So that's, that has a lot of findings from the of bones in it. And then scene four is on Adam and Eve. And I think this is probably what I'm most excited about is very few people are aware of the incredible genetic evidence mm -hmm. that has shown we came from just two people in the recent past. And after that, there was an event where we dispersed from the Middle East to form the various ethno-linguistic groups, which is very consistent with um, the Tower of Babel dispersion recorded in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Wow, I love that. I'm really excited to see that because that is an area that I'm particularly interested too. I love the, um, and I've, I've even he heard it in the scientific literature outside of creationism that 
um, you know, you, you hear people say, oh, was there a, a, an original Adam and Eve? You, ha- you're, you hear people talking about Africa and, um, and these sorts of things and that we all came from there. And it actually sounds like there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, secular data from science, um, from scientists actually saying, yes, this is right. We came from a very, you know, uh, potentially one single woman. Is that, is that what you're talking about? That's right, Kevin. It's, it's amazing because once again, we don't have to rely on creationists for our skeptics. We can, we can go out of our way and say, well, what, is, what does genetics show us? We, there's a thousand genomes project. They're now expanding that. So they've sequenced thousands of human genomes. And there's small chromosomes like the Y, the y chromosome um, or the, the mitochondrial chromosome. Those are maternally inherited or paternally inherited. And so evolutionary genetics have known this for now a few decades that all humans living today, all living humans trace their ancestry back to a single father and single mother of the whole human race. Wow. And, but this was never predicted uh, based on the evolutionary scenario. So they've had to continually revise their own theory to better fit the data. What's coming out, what's emerging from the evolution perspective is a view that looks more and more biblical, ironically. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's incredible. It's yeah. that whole thing where the, you had a bunch of scientists who get to the top of the mountain and they hike to the top of the mountain and there at the top are a bunch of theologians going, hey, we're glad you finally oh, made yeah. it up here. <laughs> so, right. so um, I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible. I love that. I, I mean, when I was in college at UCSD, I, in my classes, I constantly I heard references to things that were in the, uh, the scientific data. And I thought to myself, well, this is just what the Bible says. <laughs> and, I, and I just, I, I loved it. But so I think that's a, an incredible approach that you guys are taking uh, to do that. So that's fantastic. Um, so uh, I had a, another question back to the whole hominids and the missing links. Um, you know, uh, Neanderthal man, interesting. Um, I thought for a long time that he w- that Neanderthal man was not considered modern human. Um, and then not till relatively recently, they said, you know what, we think Neanderthal man is actually human. Is that true? Yeah, so there's been a lot of changes since, since the first Neanderthal bones were found, even before they, uh, even before Darwin's book in 1859, I think they found some of the first bones of, that later became uh, Homo neanderthalensis. And so to, in, recent, in recent times, there's been a, a, a drastic change because they've always played them, downplayed them as being brutes, if you will. <laughs> um, and it goes back even to the 1800s with, with Marcelin Gould, who was a French anatomist. And he actually reconstructed some of the early skeletons. He actually arranged the foot of Neanderthal. He put the, he put a, uh, you know what a hollux is? Apes have a hollux or a grasping big toe. Oh, he yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a big toe in line with the other four toes. So let's, yeah. Very clear. I've, I've, always, I've always wished I had one of those. Me too. <laughs> 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 it's convenient. Yeah. I can, I, I'd love to be able to do what they can do at the zoo. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> so what he did is he basically um, fraudulently, it's definitely a fraud. This has been acknowledged by evolutionary, by evolutionary paleo experts now. And he rearranged the large toe to be, to be positioned outwardly more. So it looks more like you, you created a bent knee, bent hip posture. Um, long story short, they had to downplay some of the obvious human anatomies to make it appear more, less human. But today, because we've sequenced Neanderthal DNA, we've actually retrieved DNA from their bones and it's been sequenced. We now know, just like the anatomy shows, the anatomy is human, the, 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 the genome is also fully human. And in fact, a lot of people today, most people today have bits and pieces of Neanderthal DNA, which proves we interbred with them. And based on the biological species concept, the most, the most widely accepted species concept, if you can intermarry, if you can produce fertile offspring, you are... The same species okay so they're just they're the same species they're just ancient there there's nothing different about them really um and well, ancient maybe yeah yeah so from our per, from our perspective um you know when when an evolutionist says ancient they're talking uh you know millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago what is our perspective as a biblical creationist um who believes in the literal history of adam and eve and so forth um how did neanderthal fit in there yeah, so from an evolutionary perspective, they would say Neanderthals are about 40,000 years old, 30,000 years old, all the way to maybe about 400,000 years old, some say even older. Um, and again, the, the hominids in general, they would say about 6 million years, going back to, the, going back to the, the last common ancestor, believed to be a hypothetical chimp-like ancestor. So that's their timeline for human origins. But obviously, it goes back further than that. 
um, all the way back to the first living organisms, the first uh, supposed bacterium, that would be about um, 3.8 billion years. So that's okay. the evolutionary timeline. Yeah. Um, it was even older, and then the Big Bang would be 13.7 billion years old. So the traditional biblical perspective is where we have a fundamentally different view of that. It has to do with how do you explain the fossil record. So if the fossil record was formed over millions of years through slow and gradual processes. Uh, I'm not sorry, not slow and gradual processes, through through um, you know, slow, gradual processes over time, then you would have the fossil record ba being basically millions and billions of years old. But if you believe in a global flood, as the Bible um, teaches, then you would have basically sudden burial of organisms, rapidly deposits of rock layers, you would form, you would form the the Phanerozoic, or much of the, the visible rock black record in a very short period of time. Yeah. So biblically, I do believe that the evidence from geology, from geology, from a geology perspective especially, I believe there's overwhelming evidence for a global flood. So the genetic variation within um, humans today, because if Neanderthal man is, is like a modern human, really, but, um, you know, they say that a more protruding brow, they have different things about uh, you know, the, the forehead or the CC uh, brain capacity, these sorts of things. Um, are what From a biblical perspective, are we saying that uh, the, that variation happens very quickly? Because I'll hear some um, people who are arguing for evolution say, you couldn't have that kind of variation over that short amount of time. Um, is, is there a response to that? Yeah, I think you actually can have that happen quickly, um, especially if you have any scenario where you have genetic isolation or reproductive isolation. And that's the scenario of the Tower of Babel, where you have different people groups leaving a single population, a single intermarrying population in the Middle Eastern area, area, um, Middle East area, sorry. And from there, as you separate and disperse, you form smaller reproductively isolated groups. And in smaller tribes, you will have genetic fixation, which means you'll have rare alleles, rare mutations. You can easily fix them in a small population just through random genetic drift or even selection. So that's... If you Google founder effects, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So this is, this is just straightforward genetic principles. And, and even if you have small isolated populations like Neanderthals, you would expect inbreeding. This is probably one of the most interesting findings of our, of our book, because we predicted before we found five independent studies confirming it, we predicted that Neanderthals were suffering from inbreeding. Now, most people are, under, are aware that you shouldn't marry close relations. Yeah, yeah. That's a phrase, the phrase will come out, you'll have, uh, you'll have, and in fact, we find clear evidence in the fossil record of bone deforming abnormalities caused by mutations that become fixed in populations. And so evolutionary geneticists, as I mentioned, have sequenced the Neanderthal genome, and they describe the Neanderthal genome as having a heavy genetic load, which means, in other words, a heavy mutational load. They were highly mutant. They were, they were suffering from the effects of inbreeding. Mm, wow. We have several other papers confirming this. So there is really straightforward evidence that some of these strange, strange skeletal features are caused by developmental um, abnormalities caused by inbreeding. And in small, oh, that's really interesting. It's accepted uh, in small, isolated populations. Yes, and, and because what happens is they get isolated, um, they're only um, reproducing within that small niche, and then the mutations that, that appear get stuck and keep reproducing in, the, in that small niche, and then you just get more and more health problems. Yep, so evolutionary geneticists and evolutionary paleontologists, um, that's no surprise to them anymore. That is, yeah. and so that, that's really interesting because that is consistent with a biblical perspective. It doesn't take millions of years to form these, these features. Um, it can happen very quickly in small, isolated populations. And what's interesting is this is, uh, that's the kind of the thing that happens with like Dalmatians too. Um, they, you, they kept breeding them and breeding them and then they have these severe health problems. Um, and yeah. we, we can see that in, in modern day uh, breeding methods with animals and so forth. Um, so, so along those same lines, um, is this also why, so you said, you said this is why we're see, we see in the fossil record some of these strange uh, bone abnormalities um, I, I heard, I've heard that um, Neanderthal actually, some of them they found um, were stooped over because of these bone abnormalities. And, and this is why they were giving credit to them as some sort of missing link because they were saying, hey, they don't stand upright and this is what's at, why. Is that true? 
they're, they're, they have found uh, Neanderthal skeleton early on with evidence of arthritis. But um, even even given that that that's I don't think that's characteristic of all of the Neanderthal specimens they have. There are some that are suffering from arthritis. Mars and Blue went beyond that and made it even more dramatic and, and tried to emphasize more ape-like. So yes, but you're right. Uh, pathologies, numerous pathologies are common in the hominid fossil record, especially among the homo types. And that's, like I said, that's not a secret now to evolutionary paleontologists. They acknowledge yeah. that. Do you, think, do you think that we're actually making ground in that regard? Um, we're making ground with, um, are, is the scientific community coming to the conclusion that, hey, you know, there are serious problems here. We're seeing, a, 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 we need to pick up some alternate theories. We need to reconsider, you know, what we're saying. Or is, or is there just continue to push forward with the evolutionary paradigm dis, despite the evidence that is uh, contradicting it? That's a good question. So the way I would characterize the, the field today, the evolutionary paleontology field, is that they have been acknowledging for some time now that the more, I, I even found a journal with this title, do more fossils mean less clarity? And so, the, and he acknowledges in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the author acknowledges that the more bones we find, the more we, we have great difficulty explaining what's going on in the hominid fossil record. Nevertheless, they still acknowledge that there is a pattern. And Leslie Aiello and others have acknowledged that there's basically two distinct types. There's the Homo type and the Australopithecus type. And the Australopithecus type is more ape-like and the Homo type is more human-like. And so even though they can't make sense out of it, the reason why they can't make sense out of it is because they're trying to find a series of transitional forms that go from Australopithecus to Homo, and they, they really can't connect that. Yeah. They call it a messy bush. Literally, they don't call it a simple tree. It's a messy, tangled bush. That's their words, not mine. And they say among these tangled branches, we can't figure out, we can't see a traceable lineage from Homo to Australopithecus. And so, they, and this has been acknowledged by um, Bernard Wood, a leading evolutionary paleontologist. Numerous experts now acknowledge we can't make sense out of it. Yeah. As a Christian, the exciting thing is we can make sense out of it. From their own words, we do see two basic types. There's lots of variations in the Homo type, lots of variations in the Australopithecus type. Nevertheless, they are clearly different types. There's the ape type and the human type. They coexisted. That's very biblical. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I love it. Um, you know, uh, we're just about out of time here, Chris. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for coming on the air and talking about this. I think what you guys have done is incredible. And uh, I think it's going to be very impactful down the road here as we continue to uh, spread the word and make people aware of, of the truth. And ultimately, it leads them back to the word of God. So, and uh, hopefully there's salvation. Excellent. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your time. Uh, if they're interested in the book, they can go to contestedbones.org um, and dismantledevolution.com. Stay tuned for the upcoming documentary. It's free if you want to watch it. October 9th, awesome. uh, October 9th through 11th, you guys, if you're listening. Um, this will, this will show will be up on YouTube. It'll be up on our website. It'll be airing on KPraise down here in San Diego. And uh, backtogenesis.org is Christopher Roop's website. That's backtogenesis.org with a two. DismantleEvolution.com is the documentary coming up. And uh, again, I can't recommend it more. Um, we need to be able to be uh, in, in, a, in a very um, uh, hostile culture at times. It's really important to be able to articulate why we believe what we believe and that creation is true. So please check that out. My website is EducateForLife.org. You can check that out also. Tons of resources on there for you, you and your family and your friends. And uh, God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Try to stay cool. If you're in Southern California, that might be a little difficult, but otherwise uh, stay cool and we'll look forward to being with you next time. Take care. God bless.